Hi, welcome everyone. Um, just to say you're joining the CST webinar series. Uh, we're based in Stellenbosch and the Center for Complex Systems and Transition is an interdisciplinary research center doing work um, on thinking about complexity and resilience and uh, how these ideas that are sort of created in these fields of study can be applied to real world problems from, mm -hmm. and I think most of the time we're thinking about how does change happen uh, in these sort of complex systems and how does, and what does this notion of resilience mean when we want to actually interact and intervene and um, yeah, be human and in a sense also navigate the human nature relationships um, in these complex systems. And this is our sixth webinar and we've been really overwhelmed by people's positive responses to our um, small intervention and small way of actually just collecting a number of people together and to just have a conversation in this time where people are dispersed, but also making use of the time to meet new people across the world. And it's been wonderful to, to have the feedback and the responses from, from people all over. And today we're really um, fortunate and I'm so glad that uh, that we can have this kind of this conversation today. We're really glad to be having um, Mish and Flora joining us from Sussex in, in, in England. But that's just where they are at the moment. Um, we've met and worked very much um, here in Stellenbosch and South Africa, and um, they're close collaborators of the center, but also with the Sustainability Institute, um, just not far away from our center, we've done a lot of work together. And Mesh and Flora has deep roots um, and parts of their hearts are in Africa. So <laughs> it's wonderful that, that you could be with us. And um, I won't talk a lot, um, but I just wanted to say that the, the theme for today is exploring artful body-mind practices for re resilient nature-culture relationships. And I think that is the a response to the um, conversations we've been having also with practitioners the last week or so. People were asking, so it's nice to have all these ideas about resilience, but what does that mean and how can we actually practi practically do that? And I know Mish and Flora, that's what you do very well. So um, I would like um, uh, Mish Fabre Lewin and Flora Gaethorn Hardy to um, just introduce yourselves and to just tell us where you are, what you do, and then we can continue from there. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Rika, for this invitation. It's an honor to be reconnecting with uh, the CST mm -hmm. and with my beloved Africa. I have uh, Zimbabwean heritage, was born there, lived there till I was 19 and came to England for university and have been here ever since. And my research, I was fortunate to uh, have the relationship with the uh, Sustainability Institute and Stellenbosch University. So in a way, I feel like we're in family here. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, Flo, you may like to share a little bit about where we actually are and what brings us into this research. Yeah, so we are physically um, at the moment based in the, in, the, in the county of Suffolk, in fact, not Sussex. And I'm going to say that because a lot of people make that mistake. <laughs> but we, we love Suffolk, the South Folk. And this is where we're based, where our studio is, where our home is. But we are also long-term kin and research associates, artist research associates at the very pioneering Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, which its acronym is CORE, and it is based at Coventry University. And we had the good fortune to be invited at its inception as artists to join the family of, of researchers there, which has now grown to almost 90, I think. So we're a very large community, but the director, Professor Michel Pambert, from the very outset wanted to bring the arts in as integral to um, understanding our world and doing research in rigorous ways. So that's our, our two homes. We are physically in Suffolk, but we also have a home at Coventry University. And as Mish says, we feel very at home at Stellenbosch and the Sustainability Institute as well. So we'd love to begin our time with you uh, <clears throat> through modeling how we work. So for a start, you'll see that there are two of us and we are a collaboration and collaboration, we, uh, 
if we look at what the etymology of the word collaboration, it means to co-labor. And it's that idea that we are actually working uh, to be within a relationship to our relationship with the earth. So that our research has very much to do with what it means to be in the witness of another human being um, as we do our thinking and that our thinking and our practices in thinking, which are linking into the word that Rika was uh, mentioning, that our re-enlivening of research, mm -hmm. re-enlivening of our relationship to nature cultures can only happen if we bring in a much more expanded understanding of what thinking is. And mm -hmm. I'd like to begin our time with you through an invitation to be with another and to be with the sentience of Mother Earth through a delicious tea that has been made from uh, uh, a spearmint from our garden and then to link in the global, a beautiful green scented tea. So spaciousness, time to nourish ourselves and to be in communion mm. with another is one way of re-enlivening ourselves. So, thank you, Flora. Your help. Cheers. And cheers to all of you. Mm, so, <clears throat> as a way of opening our time with each other, we'd love to light a candle to bring in some experiences and memories and to bring in gratitude and to bring in some ancestral energies because part of how we work uh, through nature culture awareness is to understand that we are not the only ones in the room at the moment. Mm. There's um, uh, a host of memories, there's a host of experiences, there's a host of ancestors there are the feelings that we have about people that we would like to respect and bring into the room. So lighting a candle helps to respect more than just our own human beingness. So it's about bringing spirit into matter and recognizing that we have many resources. It is not just what happens in our mind not just what happens in our bodies. We're actually part of a very extensive and interconnected interdependence with the world. And that's what nature culture thinking, nature culture sensibility invites, is to realize that we are not alone. And that's a wonderful way of understanding our relationship to ourselves, to each mm -hmm. other, and to the, the sentient world and what people are calling the other than human world. And I think that's what the collaboration with Flora invites, is that throughout my PhD and my research on the artful body-mind, I was always in companionship. My thinking did not just come out of my own head. Mm -hmm. In relationship, in resonance with other thinkers, with other theorists, I also had a presence and a palpable uh, consciousness that I was mm -hmm. in a continuous entanglement with. And I think that's another word that I'd love to bring in around nature culture uh, awareness is that we are in an entanglement, mm -hmm. a continuous entanglement mm -hmm. with many different energies and forces. Mm -hmm. And I think that also gave me extraordinary courage mm -hmm. and confidence within my research as an artist working uh, to do research in a center that was science oriented, Mm -hmm. uh, was about um, measurement and observations, and I was essentially pioneering an artist methodology. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I was not alone, mm -hmm. that I had a witness throughout as a collaborator, mm -hmm. um, and that also I was in a continuous interdynamic relationship with Nate and the natural world outside of myself, I was with um, the matter of food. I was in relationship to farmers and growers and ecologists. I think that gave me uh, an extraordinary anchoring mm -hmm. 
to know that I was not alone. And I think that's one of the practices that we would be encouraging, and certainly it is one that we bring into our work, is to breathe a sigh of relief (laughs) that we do not have to do all the thinking alone. And if we can also start expanding what it means to think, that thinking has a multiple range Mm. of energies, forces, and sensibilities Mm. to encourage uh, a more expansive understanding. So I'd love to um, do the touchstone work with you now. Yeah. So that would, that's what the, the candle invites in. It's not just about um, bringing in a metaphysical and spiritual dimension. It's actually also about the practice of sympoesis. And I think sympoesis, in a sense, brings in an understanding that sim, which is with or uh, together, added to the word poesis, which is making, mm. that we are making with nature. We are not separate from, we are not above, we are not in control of, mm. we are guardians of our relationship as natural organisms. So autopoesis and sympoesis have been very beautifully merged mm. together in relation to an understanding that we're not just independent, self-regulating organisms, we are actually part of an ecosystem. And that ecosystem is uh, inviting in and promoting our own consciousness. Mm. So it is about the experience. And I think matter has a very important part to play in understanding that there is this sentience around us. So enlivening has many dimensions to it because we're not only enlivening our bodies, we're enlivening our minds and our body minds as an interconnected relationship within an environment. So there's quite a reassurance in in coming to an understanding that we are not in control Mm. and that we can take charge as guardians Mm. and we can take responsibility. And that understanding of responsibility where within the word responsibility are two different concepts. There's response and there's ability. It means that we have the capacity to respond. Mm. We are able to respond. And we need to grow that capacity because I think our industrialized, monocultured worlds, our education systems have potentially truncated um, some of our sensibilities. And to grow into an artful body mind is to bring in these sensibilities which have been forgotten and neglected. So I'd love to introduce us now to a Mm. touchstone practice, which is why we are called Touchstones. That's the name of our collaboration. And it's because when we began to work together, we kept using the word touchstone. Oh, that was a really touchstone time. You you, you gave me a good touchstone. Um, I really enjoyed that time. And we decided to look up the etymology of the word touchstone and discovered that it is a, a piece of basalt, stone, uh, a dark stone from the center of the earth, which when it is struck by a piece of ore, which is silver or gold, and you're trying to decide, discover whether this is true gold or is it false gold, you would strike that particular ore onto this stone. And the mark that was left behind would give you the clue. Is it true gold or is Mm -hmm. it false gold? So what we realized when we began to work with the touchstone itself, and this is a beautiful piece of Welsh Um, granite that I found in uh, the Welsh mountains where I um, cook as a Zen Zen cook on a a Zen retreat. And this came into my hands and uh, the the Dharma leader uh, um, expressed that it was fine for me to to carry away with me to remember my time um, as a Zen cook. Um, But this particular stone enables us to remember that we are part of nature. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of matter, it's substance. And through it, uh, I can begin to remember who I am. Maybe at this point, I would just say a little introduction to how we came to be invited to share this time with you. I sent something to Rika, and I would just like to, sh- to read um, uh, it. It's a little sentence. And I think this will take us into what I'm planning to share with you about what the touchstone invites. This is from Paul Hawkin, 
um, who edited a book in 2017 called Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And my, my thesis is that one of the most comprehensive ways of um, working uh, to challenge global warming is to encourage human warming. So he says at the end of his piece called An Opening, we become human beings by working together and helping one another. That remains true today. What it takes to reverse global warming is one person after another remembering who we truly are. So, Flora, a witness in my thinking. And this has been part of one of my methodologies for my PhD. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Flora. <laughs> Lovely to be with you. And you. Where? How are, how are you? How is your, how is your being? Well, I'd love to share with you. I'd like to think out loud with you about yeah. what it means for me to invite an understanding of myself being truly who I am. Mm. <clears throat> so the touchstone helps me remember that we all are deeply in tune with our true genius if we're given the space and the time mm. and the right conditions. Mm. And to be fully authentic as a human being, mm. I need to be in touch with my imagination. Yeah. I um, need to cultivate my instinct and intuition mm -hmm. and understand that it is absolutely um, enhancing mm. of my way of knowing, mm. so that my intelligence needs to bring in the sensibility of my senses yeah. and my experience, yeah. my touch, yeah. my smell, my sense of my seeing, mm -hmm. my taste. So. A touchstone for me would help me remember that memory mm -hmm. is part of my intelligence, mm -hmm. that my emotions mm -hmm. need to be cultivated, need to be given a space and a time mm -hmm. in a bounded way <clears throat> to uncover what mm -hmm. might be beneath some of my habits mm -hmm. or my um, addictive thinking. Mm -hmm. So the touchstone for me has... Uh, a wonderful resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, a, it's from the earth. Mm -hmm. It reminds me that I am of the earth, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it uh, it gives me a humility mm -hmm. that I can't know uh, everything, and that I need to be in a relationship with the energies and be in resonance with the time of the day, the season. The um, my appetite, mm. the uh, conditions around me. Mm. So it's uh, it's a wonderful talisman mm. of of grounding and reminding and anchoring. Mm. So thank you, thank you for giving me that attention to mm. think through this mm. um, sharing of what our touchstone means mm. for us. So <clears throat> the collaboration um, that happens or the let's say the attention that happens within a collaborative space enables me to think far beyond what has just come out of my own head my own heart uh, and, the, and the idea that there is someone else whose presence can be there and enable me to do my feelings do my thinking do my do my exploring do my musings has been a a, a very profound uh, inquiry that has generated a particular piece of research and doctoral uh, inquiry that brought the artful body mind into being and the idea that to be artful is to give ourselves a much greater canvas to be uh, exploring what it means to be a human being. Science has a wonderful map to guide us, mm. offers great methodologies and instruments uh, for observation and for measurement and it needs to be complemented by the sensibilities 
of art as a, a discipline and a process of inquiry and epistemology, a way of knowing which brings in the sensibilities of emotion, brings in the sensibilities of memory, brings in the sensibilities of instinct and intuition. And touch the visceral and the personal, and that the personal subjective has as much validity as the objective, and that they need to be in an inquiry and in an intermingling dance with each other. So <clears throat> the artful became an important connection to the body-mind, that it wasn't just about making a relationship between the body and the mind, which is what we are understanding, that there's no duality, there's no not a mind and not just a body. And neuroscience has shown that very clearly, that we are of each other's um, uh, um, that the body and the mind are an interconnected organism. And I think there's some beautiful work done by a man called Warwick Fox on responsive cohesion. And that if we're trying to understand what it means to live responsively, it's to understand that what's going on inside our bodies actually has not got anything to do with the control of our heads and that our body becomes a map for how to live in the world. The heart is in a beautiful syncopation, is in a beautiful rhythm with the brain, with the gut, with the organs of the liver and the kidney, and no one is in charge. They're all in a, in a, in a dance of um, <clears throat> a, a, a functioning that helps the body to be living. So that is a wonderful map that also has helped me liberate myself and surrender to a much wider, expansive form of knowing and thinking. Mm. And I'd love to, to invite Flora in to share some thoughts mm. that she might have mm. in terms of some of what I've been sharing. Um, because what has happened in our collaboration is there's always a third space in the middle. Mm. So that even though I've been doing my own thinking, and my own inquiring and exploring Flora's responses and her feedback mm. have always helped me tune in more deeply to what it means that I might be drawing as an insight from what I have been sharing. Mm. So where would you like to take us on this journey? Well, maybe I could just reflect on some of the things you've just shared. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd love to um, amplify perhaps is... Um, I think that in transformation, within research, is inquiry are questions that um, are drawing us forward. Um, there are relationships which we embark on, new relationships with people and places and ideas. And it's a very potent time of change for us, in, whether we're in academe or whether we're in a professional job or whether we're in the realm of being a parent or a friend or a lover. Life is a constant process of inquiry. And what I found so powerful about witnessing Mish on her, on her doctoral research journey and before and after is that transformation is, can be a frightening process, a challenging process, because it involves releasing things that were familiar and allowing something new to take root. And watching you do your research you were being transformed, but so were the people around you, and we'd be entering new spaces. And for me, I would meet great challenges, um, encountering new situations that were unfamiliar or questions that were asked. And what was so powerful about this practice of working with the touchstone is the great safety it creates to be very real in that moment and to fully express the emotions as well as cognitive intellectual thoughts that I'm having. And for me, that allowed that transformation to be very real and embed in me. Um, it broke habits of thinking that had been giving me a false sense of security. So as a, as a thinking partner, thinking listening partner to me, it was life changing for me and extremely inspiring to witness a woman, a human being, grow her own intelligence and her own understanding of what she was bringing 
during her life. Um, so the, the, I think what I'm emphasizing is that transformation is, mm -hmm. is a very dynamic and often not necessarily frightening, but it, 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 it's a challenging process to be changed by your own research, to be changed by the people you meet. And that's the kind of change that we're all being invited to embrace. And I think that this very simple practice that Misha initiated and we've honed together with its own protocols and its own reciprocity. So whenever we do a touch and experience, it's always balanced by my own opportunity to share how I'm feeling. It's, it's a completely mutual exchange. That's actually the foundation of our, on a practical level, it's the foundation of our capacity then to go out into the world and be prepared to be changed again. And given that we're in a time where it's clear that the world is calling for adjustments mm -hmm. in our nature culture ways, I, I feel this touchstone practice and we can all reach for a feather or a stone with whoever we're with and we can invite them to be who they are in that moment uninterrupted and witness it without needing to <clears> intervene. <throat> and I think that's a very profound methodology and method. And I'm very grateful to have been on that journey with you, Mish. Thank you. What Flora is touching on too, I think is um, that it's not only just about being in the presence and the witness of a thinking listening partner, it's about where do we do our thinking? Where are the places? Are we thinking only in the boardrooms, only in classrooms, only behind desks, only behind screens? Are we thinking with just a matter of a, a book and, and, and our heads? Or are we going into beautiful spaces? Are we going into, into the natural environment? Are we going into, um, are we creating um, an energy flow and a dynamic of beauty and an aesthetics that invites us to be uh, feel at home and feel in touch with something greater than what the particular uh, task or project is. So for me, for example, for my PhD, I did a lot of thinking by a lake and <clears throat> a lot of musing. And um, <clears throat> in one of my uh, uh, scenes of the, of the uh, PhD, I talk about living thinking that my thinking was enhanced when I was thinking about theorists and, and their, their particular ways of seeing the world by energizing that with my thinking and with the energy of the lake and of the pond and of the birds and of the fish. It became, it became a, a, new, a new way of being, uh, true to my practice and my process. And uh, another extraordinary um, writer Craig Holdridge talks about living thinking and how nature is like thinking and how we need to we need to be enfolding a relationship with nature within our own practices of thinking um, and I think what Rika spoke about how do we how does theory and practice how can we be bringing an enlivenment into our practices whether we're working in development whether we're working in, in schools whether we're working in, um, in research, in academe, uh, whether we're in civic society. I think our practices um, are ones that need to come from our own understanding of what makes our own hearts sing. And if we're making work or if we're making um, projects that are somehow outside of ourselves, we're part of an onlooker consciousness. And part of what my thesis was inviting in and the idea of the sympoetic and the artful was that it means that we need to be participating and we need to be growing our consciousness and our, our capacity to respond within uh, uh, the participation of the nature cultures. And part of what I think has happened around our pandemic and what we have been brought to in this time of great reawakening, the great turning, is that we have been in an isolation from nature. We have separated ourselves and we have been onlookers. And what does it mean? To the courage to deepen 
our relationship to our own selves as a political uh, interaction, a process of reconnecting with the much wider communities that we are all part of, which aren't just human. I just wonder, I have been saying, we've been in a big, um, a big uh, uh, course in, of our thoughts here, and I wonder if there's any questions or comments that we'd like to introduce into the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mission and Flora, for, for sharing. And I think what you're also demonstrating is, um, is a different language that you're using. I mean, it's the language that you bring to the conversation is, is very untypical of the language that we're used to when we speak with um, in the boardrooms, even in the classrooms, um, and in the halls of academia. We, we have all these fancy ways of talking that are often artificial and full of jargon, but you've uh, created a language which is organic and real and grounded in our experience of slowness, spaciousness, humanness. And it's just so nice to also just hear that, um, you know, in the way that you talk. We've had a few questions. Um, the last one or the most um, recent question was you, Amish, you just um, recently mentioned a writer, uh, when you mentioned thinking in nature. Yeah. Was that Paul Hawken or was that someone else just after yeah, you? Yeah, that's, yeah. It's a man called... Craig Holdredge, and his book is called Thinking Like a Plant. Craig Holdredge, thank you. Thinking Like a Plant. Well, yeah, we did speak earlier that um, if people are interested, we'd love to, to share a, a bibliography which touches on some of what we've shared. Mm -hmm. And Rika was suggesting that that could be emailed out to you. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can do that. So I have a few of my own questions, but I'm going to um, uh, highlight a question from Nina Callahan, who is also at our center and um, one who, whose work I also know, um, does deep work in, in various creative and hard spaces. And Nina asked a question and it's related to your previous and last comment actually about the political way of being in the world um, that this allows us to do. So Nina asks, thank you for your sharing. How would you imagine or articulate a new kind of activism for the ways we want to bring greater justice and equality in the world. How do we keep the touchstone of who we are in what we reach for? So mm. far, we've learned to fight for it. Phew. Wow. You. <laughs> Good question. Mm. And that was um, from whom? From Nina. Nina. Nina, thank you. Well, I'm going to turn to, to Flora so I can just do a little bit of thinking out loud with her and then um, in, in response. And I think that would be the first thing that I would say is that we've learned to fight as activists. When I became, uh, my, work is, my work has been, my research was around food and how food uh, can be uh, a vehicle for transformation and for reconnecting us back into the environment so that we understand we are nature culture beings because the food is that a bridge. So uh, in the early days when I was doing my work as an artist working with food, mm. somebody named me a, cult a culinary activist. And I felt that that was, um, that was a, a good term for me because uh, I felt that I certainly was addressing environmental issues through my work as an artist. I felt it was very political. And I also because I had a lot of friends who were working as activists, food activists, I'd go on these, um, these uh, uh, midnight raids and uh, you know, deal with GM crops. And uh, it, was, it was hard, it was a hard life. It was, people were very burnt out. It was a constant battle. And I reflected a lot on my work as a culinary activist and the way that I approached it. And I remember once one of my friends who was very hardcore activist, came to one of my <clears throat> experiences, one of my food happenings, and she said, it's so incredible. People come up to you afterwards and thank you for what you've been doing. <laughs> because they felt nourished, they felt replenished, they felt sustained. And I realized that I was still an activist, but my approach was I called it indirect action rather than direct action. And I think that part of what it invited was an understanding that 
true, true activism comes from spirit and from heart. And it, in, it, it, it engages human beings in an activism inside themselves to make the change. And that if one is fighting for people to change rather than uh, creating the conditions within which they make the choice to change themselves, then you're always in a battle. And uh, my research was very much about how do I create the conditions within which uh, political as well as personal transformation can happen. So the first thing that I would be doing when I think about that activism is to say, be not alone. Think with another human being as to what might be a strategy, what might be a way that invites people to take the leap for themselves. So um, I'd love to just maybe hear the question again, because I think there was another part of it. Yes, yeah, so it was about how do we keep, first of all, how do we articulate or imagine a new kind of activism? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, I would say that yeah. who we are and what we reach for. Yeah, so keeping in touch with who we are and what we reach for, I cannot keep in touch with my, I think this whole time around the COVID pandemic has meant that people, some people have had to be very isolated especially in the, in the, in the, in the capitalist uh, uh, Western cu uh, cultures, because um, people live alone. We're not talking about how people are living in, in, in Africa necessarily, but that has meant that people have no way of being in the presence of another human being. And I think that's been a very hard relationship to navigate because to be social is to actually be in a relationship with another human being in order for us to think outside of our own selves and to feel with another. So I would, I I would be proposing that uh, this new activism, as I said, can invite a more heartful approach where we're creating the conditions for people to change, but also in terms of one's own authentic being is to make sure that you're always in collaboration, that you have, a, that you have a, an ally, that you're working with somebody else, that you're thinking with somebody else, that you're feeling with somebody else. And that it's confidential. You're not. This mm. is not about something mm. that becomes widespread or public. But it's a very. It's very much about building trust, and and building faith in our capacity to think for ourselves, and that we don't have to have answers or solutions for other people, because actually those we are all. That I had a big, uh, a big forum that I created around the theme of let us feed the nine billion. How do we feed the nine billion? And to me, that was such an insult of a question. How could we think possibly that we are responsible for feeding the nine billion? And at the end of this forum, which was called the Ecology of Food Tribe, there were about 12 of us who joined it. And we created spaciousness, we created gratitude, we created a space to think about what were other ways to approach this question. And at the end of it, we had a, a, what we called our visionaire session, where we all did collages and we did uh, an artful response to these questions and one of the beautiful responses was from someone well how do we feed the nine billion guess what there are nine billion juicy solutions each person has to be given that space to reconnect with themselves to be able to understand what is a solution and activism can 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 fall into um uh we can we i have i have done that myself fall into it where we think we can know better on behalf of other people so to become literate about what's happening in oneself is to become uh, uh, available to one's emotions and to create safe conditions in, in order to feel. And that is a daily practice. And in releasing our feelings and our emotions, which can corrode and erode our sense of intelligence and our capacity to think well and to gain insight, the, the actual releasing of emotions is an incredibly political uh, process which is very denied and very neglected in this culture. So feeling, I would say, find find someone that you can feel with to think through with what you might need to become more um, true to who you are, and then the solutions and and the need that is that is required will manifest itself. So that you don't have to figure it out because it comes to you and says, "Please, I need this needs to happen." Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? 
I no, I think that's a very, very interesting answer, and um, I'm interested in it. <laughs> and um, I, I think maybe just to again repeat that the, the practice of that this listening process that we're talking about for that safety, there are very natural protocols that you put in place. So this isn't an extended chat. It's a it's it's safeguarded by protocols of confidentiality, reciprocity, um, and it's quite a radical space because it's one where. I as the listener or Misha as the listener has no answers, but it does massively enlarge one's capacity to refresh oneself um, and, 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 and imagine things that were as yet unimaginable. Um, and so I think it is a very radical, radical commitment to make. And um, so we have made a, that commitment to each other to think with each other, to grow with each other, but we don't necess- we would never refer to, exchanges we had within our thinking listening times outside of them unless that person wanted to talk about them so I think it's very important that this this method um, and again we can share more about that perhaps after the the the, the webinar about simple protocols that mean um, there is a full capacity to trust that space um, and, and refresh one's thinking. And also um, Nina I would say the art uh, making art, artful methods are mm. very profound just to give you an idea um this is something that i've been uh, working with it's called um it's, it's based on a collage process essentially you're just working with cutting up magazines uh, uh from journals and from publications uh in order to f- answer a question so i had a question uh, based on a commission that we've just had which is what is planet possibility and what happens is you free yourself, um, if you're finding yourself with a question or finding yourself with something that needs resolution, to start working with materials that are outside of your own head and to work with matter, to work with um, the process or to go into nature and to work with soil, work with twigs, make installations, create, bring, bring in other energies to, to discover uh, directions and uh, ways forward. So Flora is going to just show you something that we we were doing in the Cradle of Humankind as part of a project called Renaturing the City, and we were working with soil, and invited uh, a young group of Black African uh, theatre makers to work with us on a project. And how we came to understand the ways to work together was to just let soil, let our practices, let our relationship to the space infuse and inform how we were going to um, make a piece. So we didn't have an idea about it. We let the matter and each other's consciousnesses come together to discover the path forward. If I may add one last piece to that. As Mish says, I don't know is a great way yeah, yeah. to get strong. Yeah. And keep saying, I don't know, is great being witnessed. And the other thing I would say Misha's brought to my life, and I think has brought to many, possibly including Rika, is care of self. Um, and a very deep understanding, which is in most spiritual texts, which unless your home of your body and your psyche is not cared for, it's very hard to venture out and help anybody else. And that care is something we have to really reclaim from capitalism. It's not about shopping. It's not about adorning necessarily. The care of self can be incredibly intimate, personal thing. But for you, Mish, it begins with food. <laughs> Good, ecological um, food that's of the season, that's um, uh, not being over, over interfered with, even in the cooking. Thank you for that question. Great. Yeah, I can only uh, resonate with that and saying that the way in which you um, live your ideas and I mean, these aren't just ideas and methods and things, what you write and what you speak about in your practices, they all flow from a very deep um, inner authenticity and from deep um, honesty with who you are. And I can just say that um, I've, from, from my interaction with you, I've learned what it means to engage and encounter um, a space where you're forced to be authentic and we can't hide between you know behind all your clever words or your methods or your your sort of um, accolades uh, you know false or justified or not but how do you actually show up as a human being first 
um, counts. And uh, that's the encounter that, you know, our exchange has brought to my life and also kind of a challenge to be more honest with myself and, you know, how I think about what it is that I'm doing in my time. I think your, what you just sort of said about um, being outside, uh, using, you know, matter outside of your own head or engaging with, you know, nature, maybe links to the, the question that Teresa has been asking, which is um, thinking and arting. Could you talk about these actions as not only being human? Um, that's the one question. And then she also mentioned that it seems that you're offering a way to, to move beyond negative critique, which is often the starting point <laughs> for protest. Uh -huh. that comment, um, I love it. But I think the question was about, you know, are they, are they, could these things sort of help us to, or think about arting and thinking as also not just only being situated in something that's human? Mm. Yeah, lovely, lovely um, invitation. I'd like to start with the second part, which is about going beyond critique, because I think in that uh, we can follow back to the first part. <clears throat> I came across the extraordinary work of um, two feminist philosopher scientists, um, Kate Barrard and physicist, Kate Barrard and Donna Haraway, as part of my thesis when I was trying to understand a relationship between nature and culture. And uh, I was very resistant to a literature review. I was very resistant to pitting different theorists against each other. I was very resistant to finding my own argument. I, was, I, I truly believed that if my research was true to an art for body mind and to enlivening of research, it was uh, the, the, the way that I would conduct my research would be to bring in many voices, to be bringing in, to be midwiving many different approaches to theory so that I'd be working with practitioners as well as theorists, those who are dead, those who are alive. I'd be working with men's thinking as well as women's thinking. Uh, and I'd be listening to the voice of nature I'd be listening to the birds. I know that they were as important as a reflection as what was happening in my mind or the book that I was reading. And <clears throat> it brought me into uh, a, th a theory of diffraction rather than reflection. If we think about a pond and a pebble or a piece of a body of water and a pebble, and you throw a pebble into a water body, it starts to have these beautiful eddies and um, expanded interaction with the water, but through the action of the actual pebble. And that is seen as, that is known as diffraction because it's a way that the one action led to many different relationships and resonances. And I felt that I was looking to use that as my theory um, rather than one of critiquing and that actually Critiquing was a way of somehow, there was an arrogance to it. There was a, 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 no, a, a, a way of trying to sort of compete and pre pre present one's own theory as the, as the best. And somehow this theory of diffraction, um, uh, which is a, a scientific um, uh, observation, it's, a, it's an instrument, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concept, was somehow much more, um, ref it was refreshing and it had more, it gave me more grounding to understand that um, I, could, I could offer theories based on other people agreeing <laughs> rather than disagreeing. And that actually they might not be all agreeing on the same point. They might be giving lots of different viewpoints which would then come to some conclusion. So, that was the, the, the theory of diffraction, which enhanced my whole thesis and changed my way of writing it even, because I called it uh, a diffractive sensibility. And 
what Barod speaks about, she talks about a method of diffractively reading insights through one another and building new insights and attentively and carefully reading for differences that matter. And rather than putting the differences against each other, the differences are helping to enhance the actual theory. So she talked about diffractive readings bring inventive provocations. They are good to think with. They are respectful, detailed, ethical engagements. And I was looking to find a way of being ethical in my approach to even my writing and to my theorizing. <clears throat> so that was the idea that if we can bring in many voices, we are actually essentially being true to a sympoetic uh, consciousness. Um, and then to the first part of the question, which was arting and thinking, I think maybe I've touched on some of it. I know that my thinking and my art does not come from my own body. I don't find it human. I know that I'm a vessel. My human body is a vessel for a relationship. But I need to tune in. I can't just say, I feel like doing this. I have to be in a space where I'm in resonance, where I'm in, in an openness. I'm in attentive. I'm receptive. So, for example, some of my art making, which is very ritual based is to go out and be in a space and just be and then I receive and I wait uh, and then I let the paper talk to me or I let the fire talk to me or I, I, I hear a, a sound of a bird and I follow that bird and it takes me to another place. So I think that I would never call my own thinking and my own art making only off from my own humanness its body and its bountifulness and its breadth of beauty and its expansiveness has come because I surrender to the other than human all the time in my work. So if we're given a commission, we never just say, oh, what do we think we're going to do for this commission? We allow ourselves to be in touch with something much greater than our own thinking. So um, there's a beautiful book on this subject. Um, uh, and in fact, there's a book, a chapter in it. The book is called, it's by Susie Gablick. It's called Conversations at the End of Time. And she's interviewed a group, a wide cast of uh, human beings to understand what is the role of art in this culture of this time. And one man has written a beautiful piece called Making Art with Centipedes. So there is that consciousness that if we are only making art from our own heads and our own thinking, then somehow it doesn't truly reflect the nature of what it means to be human cultures. Thanks for that. And um, yeah, that is one of the wonderful experiences one has um, where you, when you, both of you do um, sort of processes for allowing other people to share in that experience. We have a nice comment here from Bruce Snadden, uh, who we've also worked with. Um, Bruce is from the um, Cape Peninsula. Um, yeah, Bruce, I'm going to fail you here uh, for the name. We call it CPUT, University of Technology, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. And he's, <laughs> he's a PhD and he says, thank you for the beautiful expression of your work. So resonant with the embodied work I do with my design students and with my recently completed PhD on design sustainability and experimental pedagogy. Always mm -hmm. being in co collaboration is what it's all about, especially the power of pairs. Your presentation has reminded me of the power of thinking, fe feeling, and it is something that I will try to create cr conditions for in my course. The challenge during lockdown is how to use online meetings to do this. Any suggestions appreciated. So um, I was just, I mean, I was, I mean, I think the, this is also things that you've been experimenting with. And um, I remember you conveying something quite personal, but it was about how you, how you packed up and went to Austria during lockdown. <laughs> Maybe that's an example, <laughs> but I'm sure you have, if you have any quick, uh, we've got mm. five minutes left, um, but if you wanted to share, maybe you have some ideas for people to get together whilst they're in lockdown or online, uh, that'd be great. Mm. Thank you, Bruce, for that. Thank you for your wonderful affirmation and comment about thinking feelingly and, and the pair work. It's very, very profound. Mm. Um, so, uh, 
We have had this challenge because obviously our work is very visceral, is very palpable, is very much about matter and experience. And I feel that we need to just keep remembering that we enjoy each other's presences. And actually we can still be in presence by thinking about the surroundings that we are the context that we are in when we are having to be in these Zoom and uh, uh, digital media relationships and to do the things that we love to do, even if we're not in each other's presence. So as Rika said, I think we might share this because it was pretty wild. Um, we were due to be going to Vienna to our beloved friends who have moved there from South Africa. And we decided that we would actually act as though we had gone. So we packed ourselves the night before. We um, made a little picnic for the train, uh, and we, we sat, sat on up. the train. We sat on the train. We practiced. We 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 packed all the gifts, and then when we were due to arrive, at the time that we were due to arrive, they were at the station to pick us up. So we made this relationship, this this um, uh, plan that we would be in each other's Zoom presence at the time that we were due to arrive. And we arrived and they had made a beautiful opening in a gallery space for their, uh, our young friend is seven. And she had, in the corridor of the entrance, she had made a gallery of her paintings to welcome us. And we had brought gifts for each of them. So we spent two hours, they, uh, they had drinks ready for us. We'd brought a sober, uh, uh, special cocktail for them. We bought food and we shared the food with them. So there was a way that we actually did do quantum connection. Mm. And we um, unwrapped their presence in front of them. We talked about it and it was very spacious. Each of us did what we wanted. They took us into their kitchen. So I think there might be ways, Bruce, where you can invite people to um, bring something of themselves into the spaces. For example, uh, I was invited to give a presentation for Coventry University about my research, which was due to be in June, and obviously I couldn't go there. And they said, please, will you do a provocation? So I thought, what can I share with them? It's, I was going to cook a, cook a meal for them. We were going to talk about the relationship with food. So instead, we took 25 people into my kitchen, and I shared with them sourdough leaven processes and the bubbling up of the sourdough leaven mm. made of flour and water. I showed them bubbling processes of fermentation of kefir and um, showed them my larder filled with jars. I listened to things. So you can become a proxy as well. My body mind became a proxy for um, those who could not be in the room. Uh, so I think, I think this has been a fantastic challenge for us to become much more creative and inventive about how to reach each other and become in a quantum presence with each other through matter and through processes and practices and get away from this. It's, it's inviting us to expand our thinking and our being because it gets so tiring just to have this synthetic screen and just all the blah, blah all the time. So to have time where there's silences, where there's new sounds, there's new gestures. I think we, can, we, can, we have fantastic capacity to be very creative in this time. And playful. Playful. Thank you for all of you who have been part of this. Thank you. It's strange not to see you, but I think we felt your presence and our wonderful coordinator and mediator and host has, has given us a, a great um, introduction and, and a space for sharing our work. Thank you so much. Thank Rika. you all for being with us. Thank you, Mish and Flora, for sharing yourselves with us, your spaciousness, your beings. It was truly quantum, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was wonderful to have had a, um, yeah, an hour together where we could also just uh, connect as people and beings and um, be authentic with each other. And I hope that there's um, people will feel nourished after this. Yeah. We'll um, just to tell everyone, we'll um, th this will be this has been recorded and we'll upload it to our website. Uh, it will be available some sometime next week, and we'll sit, put together a list of references and re resources, share that via the emails that, that you've submitted to us through your registration. And it was just, yeah, thank you for your time and for sharing with us. We really appreciate that. And we, we the CST will be carrying on these webinars next week as well, right through June, every Thursday from 1 to 2. 
and we're looking forward to sharing some time with you again. Thank you for everyone that got up early in the morning or stayed awake late overseas and um, yeah, for just being with us in this time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Deep appreciation. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.